You know, I, I say that because when I first started um, at the Peter Westwick Foundation, which Mikhail co-founded, I, I started in foil. And that was pretty much the worst thing that I could start in because my sister Erin also fenced foil, and she uh -huh. was a prodigy. So if you can imagine, um, as a kid, like I'm losing to my little sister every day in practice, <laughs> every single day. So it was a nightmare, and it was stunting our, both of our growth because um, she just got it really easily. She understood the technique, the tactics, and all, all of that. And I just couldn't process everything. So as a result, um, Mikael and some others suggested that I would be better in Sabre. And that was the best thing for me because switching to Sabre kind of like, A, removed me from fencing Aaron every day in practice. Mm -hmm. And B, it allowed me to like kind of grow into like my own person because over the first two years of my career, I was known as Aaron's brother versus Keith. Because <laughs> Aaron was winning all of the local events like this and so forth. Mm -hmm. And I was coming in last at all the local events. And um, so I realized that once I switched, I, I found some really good mentors like Mikael, like a lot of the older guys at the club. And then um, it was a long path. It was a hard path because I was technically starting fairly late compared to everyone else that had started Sabre. So I didn't actually start fencing Sabre till I was about 13 or 14 years old. Mm -hmm. So if you know, like, there's already 13 year olds that are winning events. And I hadn't even fenced Sabre until I was like 13 and 14. And then my coach at the time, Aladar Kogler, he didn't really believe in doing like free fencing with the rest of the guys. He wanted me to um, learn proper technique. And that meant that I would just do drills hours by myself on a target or, or doing footwork drills until he felt I was worthy to fence Saber, like just free fencing Saber. Um, so what that led to was throughout my cadet years, um, I was just training. I wasn't really going to international competition. And it's kind of funny, but um, everyone that, that's in my age category if you ask them, like, who was Keith as a cadet or youth fencer, they're like, we don't know him. Because I never made any cadet teams, and I didn't make any junior teams until my last year of juniors. In fact, um, I made my first senior team before I made any youth or junior or cadet teams because I, was, uh, I wasn't ready. I wasn't prepared. Now, this leads me into my next question, or, or, or should I say comment. It's really interesting. And I think you're really unique in that here is a kid who didn't win any cadet titles, no youth titles, no junior titles, didn't make any junior world teams, but stays consistent, keeps practicing. He has his own idea of what he wants to accomplish, and he just keeps on grinding and grinding and grinding. And to me, it really touched me because I was thinking, how many people would normally wait around with no results. Most people are very result-oriented these days. Parents are result-oriented. Athletes are result-oriented. And you have to understand that sometimes the results don't come immediately. You could be putting in a lot of training. I remember myself, Keith, I'm just gonna use myself as an example. I was an A-ranked fencer and getting knocked out in the second round in Olympic trials. But instead of giving up, we persevered. We hung in there kept on training, knowing that sooner or later, our day would come. Tell us about your day, Keith. Yeah, no, that, that's exactly right. Um, it's all about like setting that big goal, and my big goal was to make an Olympic team. And if I had said that to anybody when I was 15 or 16, they would have said I was crazy. Erin Smart's gonna make the Olympic team, not Keith. And, and they had every right to say that because she was making all those teams and so forth. But um, what I did was, I just would say, you know what, I'm going to work as hard as possible to get to this point. So I didn't focus on the results or the, um, or the teams or the, or the uniforms, all that stuff that everybody would talk about when they would come back to the club. It was just for me, like, you know what, I only practiced two hours last night, I got to get it three hours in tonight. Or yesterday I only got 45 minutes of footwork in, I need to get an hour's worth of footwork because I know that's what it takes to make an Olympic team. Like people say you have to do footwork, lessons, drills, and I'm just gonna do that. I'm not gonna c 
cut any corners. And um, what was remarkable is that it all just started to click by the time I was 19. Mm -hmm. And most people, all of my contemporaries had started to give up on the sport by then. Harvey Miller. Harvey Miller, right. Uh, a bunch of others, like uh, Crompton, the Laval brothers, and so forth. Right. Uh, where these guys are way, way, way more talented than me. Agile, um, just really tough competitors, but they didn't have that grit. And grit is something that you either have or you don't, where you're willing to like just grind it out. And like most of my success came from, even as a fencer, as somebody that was just willing to work harder than everybody else on the strip. And that even exemplified when I was in Europe. I would go to Europe and people would say, who is this crazy American who's just going up and down the strip? Because most Americans, most anyone in Europe, if you go to a World Cup, they want to look pretty. They want to look great for the uh, cameras and everything else, and you know, look really cute. And and, I, and for me, it was like, hey, I wasn't sponsored to get here, so I'm paying my own way. So now I got to figure out I'm going to make the most of this. So I'm just going to like go up and down the strip for about 45 minutes, see how long they can last. Because I've been doing footwork for a long time, so let's see if they can outlast me just by doing forward, up and down, up and down, just grinding it out. And that was really, you know, when you started to take off. Now, let's fast forward real quick. 2008. A lot of stuff happened in 2008, Keith. Shall I, shall I preface? You, you went through a, a very, very serious illness leading up to the Olympic Games. And we were very, very fearful for what would possibly not be like a happy outcome. We were very, very worried. Could you please kind of like share you know, what you went through? Yeah. Uh, because we didn't think you were gonna make it, man. Yeah, um, so well, basically what um, happened to me in 2008 at uh, one of the last Olympic trial events, I went to Algeria um, in North Africa and ate something out when the rest of the team didn't. And when I came home, I was diagnosed with a rare blood disease. And um, I was placed in intensive care for two weeks. So the question wasn't whether I was going to fence again. It was whether I was going to live. And it really put a lot in perspective because um, a lot of doctors were like, you know, let's just get your fears in order because of how bad, like, this disease was attacking my body. And fortunately, because I was an Olympic-level athlete, they were able to put me on a very aggressive uh, steroid treatment where my body was able to respond and it ended up being like a medical case study of how quickly I was able to recover. Unbelievable. Uh, <laughs> He's a miracle child. It's unbel I mean, unbelievable. I could, we, we were like amazed. Like, yeah. it, was, it was such a fearful time, but also a very, very happy time that you recovered. So now you recovered thanks to the God and the miracle of these doctors. You get yourself back together. What, what was the formula for getting ready for 2008 and, yeah. and that Olympic silver medal? Yeah, no, it was so, after I got out of the hospital, like the thing that kind of like threw that whole last four months crazy were um, my mother also passed away about a month after I got out of the hospital. I remember that. So, you know, like she was, I think that's kind of like what did it in for her because she was so worried about my own health. And then, so basically, I had to start all over again with my training. So I had lost two and a half months of all physical activity. How much weight had you lost? I lost about 20 pounds. So, and the Olympics were only six to eight weeks away. And the US Olympic Committee, they invested a lot of money in me. And at that point, they said, you know what, we gotta get the alternate ready. Um, Ivan Lee and Ben Igo, they gotta get ready to start going because we don't think Keith is gonna be ready. I lost a lot of weight. They didn't know what my mental state was. They didn't know uh, where I was as a person. And um, basically, I just had to like get ch focused in terms of like being confident that I had worked so hard and having faith and belief in that I could achieve my goals again. And re really relying on my teammates, my coaches, my mentors, and like basically in focusing on like that long-term goal of you know what. 
I worked four years to get to the Olympics, and I'm eight weeks away, and they're not going to let me go. This isn't going to end this way. Right. So I got to believe, and I just worked hard, and those were probably like the hardest three to four months of my life, just sacrificing everything to gain weight, gain muscle, everything. Amazing. And the outcome, I remember um, being the commentator for NBC Sports and, and watching you, I believe it was the third place match or the, the quarterfinal to go into the final against France. So tell us about that experience. You were fencing, was it Russia that yeah. you went up to? Yeah, Ru Russia. You were going up against Russia and you were the I believe one of the last bouts, yeah. or the last bout, the last and you bout. were down, I think, by 10 or 15 yep. touches. It was ridiculous. Yeah. So um, the, thing, the thing that made that Olympic bout so crazy was four years earlier um, in uh, Athens, um, I was the anchor. My job was always as the anchor of Team USA. Basically, I was responsible for closing out the map. And in uh, Athens, we were fencing twice for a medal. And for the bronze medal, we were up 40 to 35 against um, a Russian guy, Poznikov. And uh, we had a huge lead. At the time, it was insurmountable. Like never before in Olympic history has somebody blown a 40 to 35 lead for a medal. And um, I lost, 45-44. Wow. And um, I was devastated. Um, my teammates were devastated. My, everybody was devastated. And it was my fault. No one, no one else to blame but me. Um, and I had, to, I had to deal with that. So fast forward four years, the mirror uh, scenario where now fencing for against Russia to get into the medal round again, now I'm fencing down 40 to 35 against the same opponent. Pressure. And um, 